my brother died. I actually lost my family within three years. And it's that shift, it was that pivot that is the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Because he was my only sibling. Mm-hmm. He was younger than me. He died first. And I was asking, I was asking God, why did you take him? Why didn't you take me? You know, why? Have we done something? Why has he, why has he been taken? Mm-hmm. Three years after that, my mom died. Three months after that, my dad died. You know, so all of a sudden it's like, okay, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. You know? So what started for me was doing grief. I wouldn't call it coaching then because people would just call me and ask that, oh, Christine, I've lost this member of my family. You've been through it. You know what it's like. How do I go through it? What happens? How do I? And it was just talking to different people. And I'm like, no, okay. I could really help people, you know, um, with my story. Mm -hmm. So went on to do a life coaching course and NLP practitioner course. And (laughs) that's really where it started from. (laughs) Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for um, checking in today with us. I'm having a lovely conversation with Christine today. She's going to tell us all about her story and her journey and the work that she do and that she does. So uh, thank you for joining in and let's get right into it. Morning. Oh, no. Good afternoon, Christine. How are you? You're in Ghana (laughs) right now. I'm good. I'm good. good. Thank you. Great. I'm so happy that we're able to connect today to have our conversation, to get to know more about the work that you do, because I'm really, when I read your bio in the group, I was like, wow, this is amazing. So I was so happy that you reached out because you're already on my list. (laughs) I was already hunting. I was like, oh, this is it. (laughs) So I was like, yay. Um, I'm so happy to have you here. Um, I, I have these conversations because I want other women, obviously men as well, but other people watching this to be inspired by our stories, be empowered and to go out themselves and, you know, do whatever it is that they've been holding themselves back to do, whether it is starting a new business, whether it's moving to another country, just live their lives out loud. And as a coach, that's how I help my clients. And I know that you're a coach as well. So I'd love to hear about your story. And I start with everyone sharing a little bit about Who is Christine? Who was the younger Christine? Who is that little girl that grew up to become you today? Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rose. I'm I'm so happy to be here, actually. And um, I I love sharing my story because um, I always believe that everything that happens to you happens for a reason. And sometimes, you know, our journey, our journey is, is changed a little bit. You know, we have a purpose, we have a goal. And sometimes how we think we'll get there is not how we do get there you know so um i'm the oldest of two siblings it was me my brother mom and dad okay um our family dynamic was really really close i mean we could tell our parents anything and everything you know we were really tight-knit family um i went to achimoto school and then i did pharmacy in the university of science and technology in in kumasi and then um Married early, had my daughter, um, divorced, married again, had two stepchildren, okay, who actually live with me now, and um, moved to the UK in 2002, and I was there for about 17 years, so it was really about the children going into school, Uh, managed a few pharmacies in the UK and all of that, okay, but you know, during that time, my brother died. I actually lost my family within three years. And it's that shift, it was that pivot that is the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Because he was my only sibling. Mm-hmm. He was younger than me. He died first. And I was asking, I was asking God, why did you take him? Why didn't you take me? You know, why? Have we done something? Why has he, why has he been taken? Three years after that, my mom died. Three months after that, my dad died. You know, so all of a sudden it's like, okay, what's going on here? Mm. You know, so what started for me was doing grief. I wouldn't call it coaching then because people would just call me and ask that, oh, Christine, I've lost this member of my family. You've been through it. You know what it's like. How do I go through it? What happens? How do I? And it was just talking to different people. And I'm like, no. 
okay, I could really help people, you know, um, with my story. Mm-hmm. So I went on to do a life coaching course and NLP practitioner course. And <laughs> that's really where it started from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you started by saying you, you know, because you, you had one sibling. And when people think about African families, they always imagine large families. <laughs> they always think, oh, you have like five and seven uh, brothers and yeah. sisters and you have cousins and aunties and uncles <laughs> living in the same house or something. But you coming from a very small family, the type of family that people imagine, you know, in Europe, you know, mom, dad, brother and sister, that's it. That's it. And you said you were very close. You could tell anything to your parents. Uh, What were your parents' uh, background, if I may say? Because is that, would you say that's usual? That's how other families were? Or did you realize as a child or growing up that your family was quite different? No, we were really quite different. Because I remember my father saying that a lot of his friends would ask him or tell him that, you know, the way that the relationship that you have with your children is, is different, is wrong. You should be stern up. You should be more in control. But, you know, that wasn't the dynamic at all. Mm-hmm. Um, my father was a doctor. He was a soldier. He was the commandant of the 37 military hospital. So he mm-hmm. ran that hospital for, for years. My mother worked at the, um, the cocoa board, mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah, we could talk about anything. And it gave us it gave us a lot of confidence as well. And um, <laughs> and he he was pro. He was a he came from pro. My mother was pro bo, you know. So I in terms too. of yes, I realized that because of your name. In terms of work ethic, oh my goodness, you know. And making sure that we understood that you know what you work hard, you reap the benefits. Mm-hmm. Okay, and it was done in such a loving way, in such a loving environment. So work wasn't difficult. It was so much fun because we'd all sit together and talk about our ideas and put the plans together and, you know, come up with a whole load of things. So it it made it fun and very, very easy to do. Yeah. Amazing. It seems like such a, indeed, the way you described it, very close knit and very different from what you would imagine most families to be at that time or even now in, you know, uh, most people are not necessarily super close with their parents at least an African household don't feel like they can tell everything to their parents so I think that's a great yeah. gift your parents gave you absolutely uh, when your brother and has made you the person that you are today somehow absolutely absolutely <laughs> so tell us a bit about you know you know you so you went into pharma you studied pharmacy you moved to the UK and you worked uh you know in that field and it's yeah. only after what happened to you, the traumatic experience that you that you went through, that you mm-hmm. decided that, hey, maybe there's something here because people keep coming to me. But let's take a step back to how did you deal? You know, because in a short period of time, there must be something that you did to overcome whatever, you know, all these yeah. and all this terrible trauma. Yeah, you know, um, because everything happened so quickly, the thought process was why? That's always is like, why? Why is this thing happening? Is there something that we've done wrong? Is there something that, you know, I have done wrong? Is there something that's within the family? What, why, why? Okay. And the only way I was able to get through it was I took each one of them separately and really thought about, you know what? What has that legacy, what has their legacy been like? All right. My brother died at 36. I looked at what his life, what he'd achieved in his life. And I said to myself, and I said, you know what? He's done so much in, in 36 years. It's equivalent of what somebody could have done in 70 or 80 years. So I said, I said, you know what? It's okay. You've done everything that you needed to do. So it's time for you to go rest. That's how I had to switch my mindset. Mm. All right. With my mom, you know how, you know, mothers and their sons, mm. you know, her only son, she'd lost her son. My mother never recovered. I would say she died of a broken heart, yeah. you know. So for her, um, not long after my brother died, my, my dad was diagnosed with liver cancer. Mm. All right. So for me, how I looked at mommy's own was that there was no way she could have gone through losing her son and her husband. Mm-hmm. So it was her time to go and rest. Yeah switch that mindset and with daddy it was the same thing I had to sit I'm like you know 
you've done it. Your legacy is 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 amazing. You know, mm. there's still a picture of him and his name. As if ever you drive past 37 and you look up, daddy's name is right there. You know, mm. so it's the people they've touched and what they've done in their lives. It was like, okay, you know what? It's okay for you to go rest. And that's the only way I was able to deal with it, you know. So when people come in and they're asking these questions, I'm always asking, what was their life like? What did they be behind, you know? And you can always tell, especially during the funerals, just how much other people are impacted by their lives. Mm-hmm. So the thing is that without them, they are, they are just as important in different people's lives because yeah. they are part of each person's journey. Mm-hmm. you know so that that is always such a comfort and just the way to be able to deal with the whole thing but i tell you it was it was hard can, it, it was it i was cannot hard. imagine i cannot even say i can hard. imagine i cannot i cannot imagine how hard. Hard. hard this yeah. must have been for you yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 tell us a little bit about you know there's a big i wouldn't say culture but i guess culture about there's a lot of I don't know the word, the right word to use here, but death and funerals are quite big. Mm. In Let's just mm. put it that way. Mm. And having been born and raised in Europe, when I moved, I always knew it was a thing like that we celebrate the person's mm. life after passing in a in a big way in Ghana. But I never quite understood it or yeah. realized how big it was till I got to Ghana, and I was like, oh wow, okay, this is like a thing, and. <laughs> But I also only got the chance once to be really close to someone who lost their parents and see yeah. how, because you see the big display and the big event, blah, blah, blah. But you, unless it's your family and you're close to it, you don't really see what goes behind the scenes, goes on behind the scenes. Could you tell us a little bit for those of uh, watching that don't understand the culture, how funerals and all, how death is, is in a way, life is celebrated through death, if I could put it that way. Yeah, I think that's the that's the best way to put it. I mean, left me alone would celebrate would celebrate the life before the death. Exactly. You know, that's that's how it really should be. Mm-hmm. You know, but I think for us and the culture, it's a way to just show respect and love and um celebrate that person's life. Okay. Like I said, it's a shame that it's always done after the person is gone. But mm-hmm. you know, for everybody else, that's that's the celebration. When you're in it, though, it's a totally different story because mm-hmm. you're not cele- you're not really celebrating. You're trying to cope with the loss. You're yeah. trying to understand what has gone through. You're going through stages of grief, you know. So, I mean, for me, because everything happened so quickly, it was just like one after the other. You haven't really processed the first one and then you're dealing with another one. Yeah. So it's just having to deal with the loss. You're asking yourself the questions. You're mm-hmm. you're trying to um, navigate the fact that they're not there with you. You know, um, different things are triggering different memories. It's 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 different. But because also within our culture, we are we have such big families and we have extended families. Everybody comes to help. You know, and and. I don't think we can do that out of Ghana Mm. (laughs) because living abroad is different. We don't do really big families abroad. You you, you know what I mean? Um, Mm. It's usually just um, a core core family dynamic, you know? Um, So the help usually will be a little bit of that and usually friends and families, but in Ghana it's massive. Everybody who, and sometimes people you don't know, but they're related, you know, they all come together and come and help and, and help you through it. So, yeah. yeah. Tell us a little bit about, we have, you know, going, I would have loved to go a little bit into, you know, your childhood in Ghana, because you mentioned that you went to school in Achimota. And I know it's, mm-hmm. Ghana has, you know, like everywhere, probably they have these big schools that uh, everybody's kind of cheering for their schools and I yeah. know I have friends who went to Achimota <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, everybody's rooting and there's a big every school had the kind of their culture and what they stood for could you tell yeah. us a little bit about that for those that are nostalgic <laughs> um, well, in terms of like my my time in Achimota yeah your time in Achimota um, made that school so special in your you know what do you think made the school so special going to Achimota was was it was like a no-brainer 
daddy went to Achimota, it's like all oh, his children are going to Achimota, you know. And to be honest with you, it was the best time of my life. I did Achimota from one to six, you know, it was the best time. And I think it's also um, that boarding school experience. You, you, I went into school when I was 11. You know, we start at 11 and you form such deep and long lasting friendships. Okay, mm -hmm. and I think it's the culture too. You're in there, you're taught how to clean, you know, uh, it's the discipline, you know. Um, I think that for us is the most important thing. But the friends, the friends that you meet, the friends that you bonded with, the things that you go through with them together, even sometimes when we meet today, you know, you're still talking about things that happen in school. And that rivalry between um, all the different schools, especially when it comes to athletics, you know, and we're all in the same place and everybody's rooting for their school. And it's not even just the school. Within the school is the different houses as well. Mm. You know, all that friendly competition and, you know, trying to be the best uh, version of yourself, the best person that you can be. And um, also, I think when you're in a group community like that, when people are doing really well in school, you know, it gives you some motivation it gives you some inspiration to be able to also do well yeah you know because you're, you're all kind of competing everybody's doing so well it's like okay yeah you know when they're giving out the prizes like oh you know i want that prize too you know so you you strive to do better so it, it's awesome i still i still have my other friends you know who are just as close to me today as they were when i was i was younger you know so it's yeah. awesome <laughs> i think when i i came when I came to Ghana, I realized how big the school culture is. And I didn't school in Ghana, but you know, I, I had friends from from uh, um, Gehe, from other schools as well. So it was like, ooh, these schools and these schools and every girls and this, that. Yes. And, and I, yes. just, I mean, I can relate to building, making friendships in high school that are life, you know, long friends because my yes. best friends are those that I made in high school then I wasn't in boarding school so I even though that's a different experience I can relate to you know sharing those experiences you went through the struggles in school and I can also imagine the network in Ghana that you absolutely outside that you build because these schools you know excellence was you know very important Try, trying to be the best at what you do not necessarily only at Chimosa but I think all the schools had this um you know um energy that they wanted to go for the best and strive to Absolutely. become the best yeah 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 so, Absolutely. yeah that's, that's amazing <laughs> you know the reason why I always wondered how kids in you know because people used to say uh, parents who send their kids to boarding schools you don't see yeah. your kids that much so how do you bond with them but then when I hear your story of saying you and your family your parents are really mm -hmm. close it means that you being in boarding school did not really affect that relationship as much how how would you say that? How often did you go back home? No, you're you're in school for you're in school for the term. Um, um, there are certain days that you know you have exams and stuff, but you're you're in school for the term. And when when you're back home, you know you're home for the holidays. I think with us, Daddy made it a point not to let us travel during. The t all the, most of the time that we were in school, you know, sometimes I didn't understand what the man was doing, but of course he was a psychiatrist as well. So, you know, in, in hindsight, I kind of like got it. But when we were home, it was us doing things together. So we were working together. We were doing things together, you know. So building that home relationship, building that bond between parents. And I always used to ask him, he's like, why would you let us travel? It's not that we couldn't. He's like, no, it's not the right time yet. You know, you when you finish, and he used to say that, he said, when you finish school, you'll be traveling so much. I'll be calling you and telling you that, you know what, we need to go here. And then you would tell me that, he's like, oh my God, no, it's okay. <laughs> I don't want to go, you know. And when that happened, that actually did happen. When it happened, he looked at me and he said, do you remember I told you and I'm like, yeah, 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 you did, you know, because it's like one minute, you know, let's go here. And another minute, I'm like, no, I'm tired. We just came back from this trip. It's like, yeah, because that time, that time in school, it was school time. And then it was time for home, you know? Yeah. So I think for us, that was the difference because a lot of other people, when they're on holiday, they're traveling and not necessarily traveling with parents, traveling, mm -hmm. you know, so um, I can't say that affects their bond, but I can only talk about 
how it was for mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. And, and and that made a great impact. It made a great yeah. impact. Yeah. Because in Europe, when you look at, most people don't go to boarding schools. That's not a mm. thing. Yeah. Um, some, you know, some special school, but it's really like, oh, special private schools where you have to go away because it's a special school. Or they even see it as negative. Like your parents are busy. They don't have time for you. So they send you off. It's yeah, like you send true. that child off to boarding school. It's a negative connotation yep. almost. So Dif- different concepts. It's a different concept. <laughs> so for people watching, they're thinking, oh my God, everybody was in that boarding school in Ghana or, you know, most Afri- West African at least that yeah. I know went to boarding school was a thing or day school. And kids loved going to boarding school, preferred actually going there than to be, you know, coming back home day school and stuff. So yeah, it's a very true. interesting dynamic and it creates relationship and I think a culture as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you went to the UK and you were working there, how was it like for you to leave Ghana, been working there for so many years and then moving to the UK? What can you remember that was um, shocking? Well, to be honest with you, a bit of a bit of my childhood was spent in um, in the UK. Um, when my father was going to do his speciality, when he was going to do his psychiatry, we spent, I think, was it five years, five, six years in Scotland and then in England. Mm-hmm. All right. So it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it okay. wasn't difficult. Yeah, mm-hmm. it wasn't difficult. But to be honest with you, I did not want to go to the UK. I love Ghana. I mm-hmm. love working here. I love living here. Um, for us, it was more of a school thing. You know, it was taking the children to school because they just changed the, the education system here just when they were getting ready to go into boarding school, etc. And then everything was changed a little bit. We're like, you know what, let's just take them to school um, abroad. And um, for me, it was as soon as my youngest was in uh, college, I was coming straight back home, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and for, for it was it was for a long time, it was just me and them. Because yeah. my husband was in Ghana, you know, and would come come and go, you know. Um, so then we got really close too. Yes. You know, because what what I learned growing up is what you know that's the thing with parent parenting. Yeah. You can only parent the way that you have been parented. Exactly. You know? So what the I had and the bad. <laughs> the good and the bad, you know. So that's what we do. It was a lot of us together working. Their home, work home, work home, you know. So hopefully we build a really good foundation for them as well. But yeah. yeah. Hearing that your father was a psychiatrist, a psychiatrist, yeah. would you say that somehow it was almost like uh, I wouldn't say you're pre- predestined to be because <laughs> coaching is not completely the same, but in a way, nurturing, taking care of people, mm-hmm. helping people deal with traumas mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Would you say that somehow maybe that influenced you? Um, you know, I, I haven't really thought about it like that. I mean, maybe, but it's interesting because what I'm doing with, what I'm doing now, it's really also from what I did in school. Because when I was doing pharmacy, I happened to do my thesis and concentrate on plant medicine. Mm-hmm. So when I started doing what I'm doing now, I kind of sat and I'm like, hang on a second. Everything has just come right round, you know, and it just yeah. comes back to everything happening at the right time and the right place, stuff like that. But, you know, to be honest with you, I, I, I used to love watching him work and I was always asking questions because he wanted me to be a doctor. I mean, daddy, daddy wanted one of his children to be a doctor. And I said, I said, you know what? I'll do the second best for you. I'll do pharmacy, but I'm not doing, <laughs> I'm not doing medicine. I mean, I, I see blood, you know, there were times I'd go in with him into the, into the theater, or we walk into some ward and all of that. And, you know, sometimes I'm like, no, I really don't think I can do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it, it, it might have, that's an interesting way to look at it. It probably did subconsciously. It, it probably, mm-hmm. it probably did. Yeah. I would um, like to talk about your specialty, choosing to be, how would you call yourself, a death coach or a transition? How do you call yourself? What is the, okay. so many um, things, but I would like to hear how you. Yeah, I, 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 I really call myself a life coach mm-hmm. and a grief coach. 
Yeah. And um, yeah, usually I'll say it's a good coach. But to be honest with you, I put it under one umbrella and I'm, I'm, it's easier to just say I'm a wellness coach because I'm having to do quite a lot of health and wellness coaching as well. Yeah. Yeah. Which ties in because with the push that I'm doing, it's a holistic approach, mm-hmm. it's a 360 degree approach. It's physical, it's mental, and it's emotional. Yeah. You know, so that brings in that the coaching for that aspect as well with the mental and emotional, the ones that um, have lost and they're grieving, we deal with that as well. For mm-hmm. people who want to just make sure that they are on a healthy journey, okay, mm-hmm. we're trying to deal with that as well. So it's just the little tools that are coming together to just make sure that everybody is just living their best life. <laughs> yeah, amazing. In a couple of years ago, actually when I was in Ghana and I became pregnant of my first child, I started learning a lot about what just pregnancy and motherhood in general just doing. I'm someone who loves to research. So if I need to do something, it's like, I'm not saying I want to be an expert at it before I do it, but I want to know as much as I can. Okay. And when I came here in Belgium to deliver, I decided to get a doula. And, okay. uh, and it wasn't really a thing here. And so I got a midwife who happened to be a doula and she was uh, from Congo. And as she was helping me, she's like, are you, do you work in the health sector? Do you, you seem to know quite a lot about this already. I don't know why you're paying me. But yeah. I said, well, I did a lot of research. And then a couple of months later, I decided to do a training myself. I was so um, intrigued about the whole process, um, how magical was the experience of birthing. And I felt so empowered to empower yeah. other women. I was like, how is it that we're so scared of giving life when it's really all natural and we're made for this? Right. Absolutely. And so later I learned about uh, the term of a death doula. And I don't know if you've heard of that. So um, there's a different name, Transition Doula. And this was a person, and uh, actually, I think she's Ghanaian. She's in the US or Canada. That's the first person I found that was doing this profession. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. And she um, helps people transition from this life to the other, to the next. So they themselves, when they find out that they're passing away, and also family members deal with you know, I'm going to die or someone yeah. is knowing how to deal with it. So yeah. I wonder how related that is to the work you do. Do you help people who are themselves transitioning and how do you actually help their family members if other people are transitioning? Okay, um, I don't do the, the people that themselves who are trans- transitioning. Mm-hmm. It's usually usually the family members. Okay, so how it's does that the- go? How does that go? What kind of support um, do you give them? Sorry? I didn't quite what kind of support do, do you give them? What are some of the tools or resources? What does someone okay. get from coming to you, to see you? Okay, so usually um, the coaching sessions um, usually focuses on letting them understand that it's a journey, okay? And just coming to terms with what this person, how this, how this person um, live their lives, how they fulfilled their purpose, how you need to, um, yes, you miss them, but you need to know that we are all in this world and everybody's interconnected, okay? And then it's always, for me, it's always that part of having to let them go. That's usually the most difficult part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, and there are certain tools, there are certain NLP tools. There are um, uh, sometimes we give you, we give you what we call anchors. We give you anchors. You know, um, there are tools where we sometimes it's, it's not really. I don't put you in a hypnotic state, but mm-hmm. we kind of take you back and let you deal with certain things, and then bring you back to now and bring you back into the room there are different tools that we use, but the most important thing is for you to look at it a little differently yeah you know because everybody is a, you know i'm afraid of death and and this person has gone and it's like oh my god i miss this person how am i going to cope what's going on so when you start to realize that no you know what everybody's really connected you know people are coming in people are going out you know and we have to allow them to go 
I had one client um, whose mother was ill for sharp breast cancer for 15 years, you know, and she looked at me and she said, she said, Christine, I could tell my mother was to tell me that, you know what, let me go. Let me go because I was the one holding on. It's like, you know what, I don't want you to go. I'm looking for this medicine. And, you know, she said there were times when she could see that. It's like, no, I'm ready, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. and it's so much, you're trying to do so much and stuff. It's like, no. So she sat and she's like, okay, now nah. it's like, okay, I, I get it now. You know, there are times when it's just, it's more peaceful. They're ready. We are the ones who are trying so hard to keep them here, yeah. you know? And when the time comes, we need to do it with with love, yeah. And just allow them to allow them to rest, yeah. To go peaceful. allow them to, yeah. To be peaceful, allow them to rest, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'd love to transition into transition the term <laughs> into <laughs> you know your work as a holistic wellness therapist because you mentioned yeah. that you did pharmacy, but actually you have you you already saw that you had interest in you know, using herbs uh, for your well-being and so on and so forth. And I know that you have a wellness practice or, you know, yeah. so could you tell us a little bit about how you got into that, how okay. you, you know, realize that, oh, okay, this is actually something I'm interested in pursuing for yeah. myself and then for others. Yeah. Okay. So what, what happened was um, with, with the pharmacy, when I was practicing pharmacy, um, one of my biggest concerns was the side effects, the mm -hmm. drug side effects and the drug drug interactions. So I remember with my practice, I had cards for everybody, you know, we scan them, we take as much history as possible, we'll see what drugs you're taking, we'll see what other things you're taking, we were monitoring side effects and everything. It was, it was a big thing for me. Then after my dad died, and I remember a week before he died, he had, dad was a huge meat eater, huge huge you know and I remember him asking he's like you know what do you think it's all this meat that I've been eating that has caused this for me and at that time I took him I said I said daddy you know what I really don't know I, I don't know you know so when he died I decided I said I'm going to do a week I started I said I'm going to do a week of no meat you know I'm going to do like a, a vegan week and just see how I feel so I did I did a raw food I did a raw food week right lost six kilos and then kind of like thought to myself I'm like okay if I can do some of these things naturally it actually takes away all the side effects takes away all the drug drug interactions okay I call what I'm doing a natural pharmacy because when I came back from the UK when I moved back from the UK there were just too many pharmacies around to too many of them too many so i also wanted to impact my community in a different way i wanted to see just how i could also help in a different way and my favorite 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 shop what i'm doing now is kind of like based on the uk's holland and barracks mm -hmm. i was actually looking to see whether i could bring the franchise to west africa you know yeah. and um they called this horrendous price and i said to myself i said no i'm coming to do it myself you know, with my own local produce because we have so much here and mm -hmm. we can support our local entrepreneurs as well. So that's where the shop came, you know. So I'm trying to actually give the same efficacy that medication does, but with natural products. Yeah. So yeah. To eliminate the side effects and the drug drug interactions. Amazing. It's wonderful. I, uh, you know, and I think that's one of the, the things that got me so interested into your profile. And I guess you into mine as well because we're both yeah. into the whole holistic lifestyle yeah. and wellness and when I moved to Ghana I was able to I, I got you know I was into uh, herbal remedies I really loved all of that already but when I got to Ghana I deepened myself into it and did myself a detox a personal detox because I suffer from fibroids and that really mm. helped me um you know, I may not have some medical, the, the medical proof I have is that my fibros have not multiplied or grown. And yeah. I was told that I probably wouldn't have kids or would have a lot of mm. this, which I never had. Mm. I was able to conceive naturally and have yeah. no problems birthing my three kids um, with no pain awesome. medication, with nothing. Yes. And I really believe that it was thanks to the herbal treatment I went through in Ghana, but also the change in lifestyle. 
That's it. I'd like to add that because a lot yeah. of people are always looking for potion magic drinks here and there, but it wasn't just that. It was that and a change of lifestyle. I think probably the change of lifestyle more. So I also yeah. um, cut eating meat. I was actually a pescatarian for almost a year and a half, and that started in Ghana. And I must say it was a lot easier to be pescatarian or even vegetarian in Ghana mm. than it was here, which is weird. Really? Because I always thought, oh, it's going to be so difficult. Everybody eats meat in Ghana. But our, I, thought, our meals, I thought it would, it would be the other way around. Because... A lot of our meals are easy to, you know, um, red, red. There's, you know, you can have it like that. <laughs> Apparently. And the contemporary, the contemporary, you know, all of those. But it's interesting because quite a lot of people always tell me, it's like, oh, but you, you know, you're vegetarian, you're vegan, and sometimes, but what are you going to eat? Are you just going to eat salads and, you know, what? And as soon as I start mentioning these foods, I said, I eat red bread, I eat wache, you know, exactly. I eat red bread, wache, I eat contemporary, I eat aboma, I eat garden next to you, I eat all of those things. And after yeah. all of a sudden, they sit and think, it's like, oh my God, yeah, those are all vegetarian foods. Yeah, all of them. so there are more options in Ghana. It was easier That's for true. me to do it without having to change so much because mm -hmm. those were the things I enjoyed eating anyways. Yeah. So when I came here, the European meals and the stuff we cook, there's always a side, this, this, that. And I was like, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. as soon as you start adding this and make an exception for this and that, you're like, you know what? I'm actually back to square one. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, it's so interesting with what you said about it's the change of your life, lifestyle because that's 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 the main goal, you know, because I don't do diets for my clients. I said, you, you can't do a diet. It's not a two-week, one-month thing. No. You have to do the little things consistently and make sure that you can sustain that for the rest of your life. Yeah. Because yeah. that's the whole thing. I think you know? Ghana was way more easy. I mean, every morning I got my coconut water from the seller from the street that would knock on my door and yeah. drank that. I used to yeah. cycle. I joined a cycling club in Ghana. We mm -hmm. used to ride 50K on weekends and go to, oh, wow. Italy, go to you know, so many places. <laughs> and it was mm. kind of a lifestyle change. I think that uh, living in Ghana makes it so much easier, easier than we think. And so tell us a little bit about the offerings in your shop, in your, uh, in your, in your, you know, in your shop currently. What do you have for people? Okay. All right. So um, it's a health and wellness center. Right, so it's a lot of um, naturopathic assessments mm -hmm. to start with. All right, so um, I do a lot of energy work as well. So quantum assessments, you know, we do body composition analysis. Just, we start with that to just get like a baseline of what's happening in your body, all right? So when we need to, the different wellness therapies, we do detoxes, um, reflexology, all the different massage therapies. And a massage, I always call them experiences because they're not just ordinary massages. We do it with energy work as well. So the room that you're in has already been energized with positive energy. You know, you're surrounded by healing frequencies and, and, um, and vibrations. You know, the oils and what we use for the massages have been <laughs> energized with healing crystals and all. So it's an, it's an experience, okay? And then, of course, we want to support your healthy living. So the shop has all your seeds and nuts, nuts and, you know, healthy oils, all your health food and natural products. So for skincare, hair care, we do all of that as well. Then the coaching comes in, you know, because it's holistic, isn't it? So it's not just physical. We want to make sure that, your mind and your heart, you know, your emotional well-being is just as strong. Have you, are your buckets full? Yeah. Are you full enough for you to be able to give to of overflow. yourself to other people, to overflow, to give yourself to other people, you know? So we, we do all of that as well. And um, yeah, that's, that's, basically, that's basically it. <laughs> that's amazing. I, I, it's just a place where you just enter and come out feeling fresh, that's, that's and renewed. Want. And, you that's know, perfect. ready to take on the world. Ready to take on the world. <laughs> ready to take on the world. You know? I cannot wait to, to, to visit and to have my own yeah. wellness um, session with you. Session, waiting for you. Waiting yeah. for you. <laughs> I need those massages that I've been craving. <laughs> it's so lovely. So I want to ask you about how mm. the reception has been for you, for, you know, Ghanaians. Do you have... Because I know Accra is very expat and returnees and this, that. And mm -hmm. when you're talking about crystals and 
energy and you know all these things for me it makes a lot of sense because that's my world mm. but i'm not i wonder whether to the um, Ghanaian on the street is that new or do they are they mm. interested what has been the reception like okay um it's most most people don't really get it with the crystals mm -hmm. most Ghanaians don't really get it with the crystals when they come in and they experience it then it's like oh wow Okay. What they do know, what I also tell a lot of people is use salt. They know that one. They know the salt. They know the pekese. Mm -hmm. So when we tell you that, okay, you know, once in a while, do a salt bath because it cleanses your energy. Then they remember things their mother has said or they remember things their grandmother has said that, you know what, salt cleanses. You know, so when you're tying that in with what they're doing, then they kind of they kind of get it. But with everything else, it's a slow process. Yeah. When we're doing our energy, energy work, the cleansing, the you know, uh, giving you back your positive energy, you get people asking, Oh, is this spiritual? What are you doing? <laughs> and stuff like that. And it's like, no, you know, I said sometimes when you go into a room, there's somebody that you haven't met before, and you look across and all of a sudden you feel it like your sisters. You feel that kind of bond, a special connection. So those are your energies in sync. Other hand, you can go into a room and you do not like the vibe in there at all. And almost everybody has had that experience. I said, that's your energy as well, you know? So then they kind of like understand that, okay, everybody's got an aura, we are surrounded by energy. This is probably what it is. So it's, it's a slow process, but yeah. I'm just happy when somebody walks in and, we do it and they're like, oh my, you know, and they're coming out and it's like, oh, I've had an experience. So lovely. Yeah. I love how you explained it. And it reminded me of what um someone said to me once is that we think that our body and then our aura is around, but it said we are the outside and it's just this body that's holding it together. But actually absolutely we the yep. real person we are, the soul, the energy vibe is the outer version. Is the outer. And that touches everybody's outer version. Yeah, so that's how we're all connected. That's why we're connected. That's yeah, why we're yeah. connected. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. For, for people, and we've talked about the big funerals in, in, in Ghana. Anytime anybody goes to a funeral, it doesn't necessarily have to be in Ghana. But when you come back, have a salt bath. Mm, have yeah. a salt bath and just cleanse cleanse that energy. You know, because you, you're, you're, around, you're around different things, you know. So come back and have a, and if you don't have a bath that you can lie in, you know, put a handful of, of it has to be nice rock salt, not iodized salt. Mm -hmm. You put some salt in a bucket of water and then just rinse, rinse yourself after you've, you know, you, you've had a bath. Yeah. You know, and yourself. It's interesting to me that we're having this conversation. My mother, I guess my interest in herbalism and natural healing and just um, ancestral healing comes from my mother. My mother is a queen mother. Uh, okay. A town near Kintampo. And my mom has always been really interested in ancestral healing and herbalism mm -hmm. and all of those mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And this morning we were talking about salt and she was like, actually, I, I read somewhere, no, she watched somewhere that salt had, a, you know, cleansing energy. And I said, yes, that's why people put it in front of their doors or in front of the windows in the corners of their houses to clear yeah you know, bad energies and stuff like that. And it's so interesting. We're having this conversation now. You know, my mom is from the third generation, but I love how you're mm. explaining it. For her, it all makes sense. And I think she's yeah. one of those people that she just <laughs> always got it, <laughs> regardless, you know, of where she lived or whatnot. <laughs> but, you know, I can imagine a lot of Ghanaians her age will be like, oh my God, there's some spiritual thing, yep. whatever. I don't always. Yeah, yeah. It's oh, very it, difficult. Is, is it spiritual? And I'm like, okay, so then even if you look at it as a spiritual, what, what is spiritual. spirit? Everything's spirit. You know, it's, it's around you. You're, you're, you're surrounded by it. So, you know, you, you want, you always want good energy. You always want good energy around you. Always. Yeah. You know? I would love to hear your point of view or just your experience with, because what you do is a little bit of herbalism. Would you call that herbalism as well or not? Mm, a, a little. A little, because a in little. Ghana, there's a lot of herbalist center or herbal center or stuff like that. And 
you know, they're probably good ones and they're ones that are fraudulent and trying to pretend. Yeah. So what is your take on that? Because as Africans, we have a lot of good herbs. We have everything that we need, not just Africans, but the world. We have everything we need. Yeah. Food is health. Uh, everything, yeah. the herbs around it are for healing purposes, not just for eating and being full. In Africa, we have a lot of these, but many people shy away from using them because they think it's spiritual or, you know, negative spiritual or whatever. What is your take mm -hmm. on that? And how do you bring those two together? Okay, what I'll say is that uh, the reason why I think a lot of people shy away from it is how it's being portrayed in the past. Because mm -hmm. then you've got the, the herbalist, you know, in a loincloth and he's picking the herbs and he's mixing it something, he's chanting all of these things and it's like, whoa, no. But then if you look at all the things that we have in Africa, if you look at the raw ingredients that we have, a lot of Europeans are coming for our ingredients, they're taking it back, they're repackaging it and selling it back to us. Yeah. I'm a big, 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 big person, you know, about packaging. Yeah. It has to look good. All right. So if I say that I'm doing a little bit of herbalism, herbalism, yes, why not? But I'm doing it in a way where it's, it looks like it's a pharmacy. Mm -hmm. it's a All piece. the products are packaged properly. It must look good. It has to look appealing. There has to be a reason for using it. So what, first of all, if I see it, it's att I'm attracted to it. It looks really good. I'm asking, what does this do? I'm explaining to you the things that it does, mm -hmm. okay? And you're coming to a place where it's a building. I'm not sitting in a back alley somewhere. Mm -hmm. Those are the little, little yeah. things, you know? So it's a little bit more kosher, right? A lot of the things in the shop, I, I try and um, support a lot of local entrepreneurs. So we stock a lot of different vendors products, mm -hmm. you know, but if it doesn't, if it's not packaged properly, it doesn't look good. I will stop. Yeah. I won't. I need to know where it's from, how you've done it. What's the efficacy? It needs, we need to elevate what we've got a little bit, you know? So there's no, why, why if, if Europeans are coming to take it away, <laughs> it's good. Yeah. It, it's good, you know, so we must be able to use it. We must be able to package it the same way. We must be able to present it the same way that they are doing. I don't see why we can't, you know, we're just as capable. So that's where I think the switch, the switch needs to be a little bit. And, you know, I think a lot of times we're not able to explain it very well, what something does and why it's good, because I remember as a um, growing up, I knew that women in Ghana after having uh, a child would sit and have a uh, vaginal steam. I knew that was a thing. I had heard it before. And then um, maybe like 10 years ago or something, I heard about beet steaming. That's a thing in Asia and in in uh, in South America. And I was like, well, that's nothing new. Like I, my mom told me <laughs> like they did this in, 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 they still do in Ghana probably in villages. But it's yeah. funny how, as, again, you say, we, we think what we're doing is like, oh, wrong, and it's something for the village, or maybe it's not nicely packaged. But then when others do it in their ancestral way, we're fine it's with it. Thing. The women in Asia or the women in South America, what? they don't do it in a, you know, in a clinic somewhere. They sometimes also, sometimes it's packaged, sometimes it's not. But how, mm. how is that disconnect, though? Because it seems like everything that's coming from us, when it's coming from our ancestors, we're like, oh, it's probably not good. It's... Yeah, it's... <laughs> It's, it's 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 marketing and advertising everything everything foreign we've been taught that everything foreign is better than what we have locally so now there's a big drive you know to to let everybody understand that what is local is better yeah we're actually doing um a thing next next week where uh, a group of people were trying to let everybody eat and drink everything made in Ghana. We're challenging people that, you know what, when you're eating your food, when you're going to buy a wachi, ask your wachi seller, is there rice Ghanaian? Are the beans made in Ghana? Is the oil that you're using made in Ghana? What, what, what are we eating? You know, it's like, let's eat local for, for, a, for a week. 
And it goes to show just how much <laughs> we rely on things that are not from us, you know? And also to let people understand that we have alternatives. You know, it's that, it's that pride that I think we've lost a little bit. Yeah. The pride of being Ghanaian, the pride of being African, the pride of knowing that, you know what, when I take some salts, you know, when I mix it with prekese, you know, when I have a bath or I put it in the front of my house, I'm protected, you know, stuff like that. Or after I've had a baby, you know, I can put some herbs together and put it in some water and, and steam it and sit on it. And, you know, it's antimicrobial, antibacterial, you know, it's an antiseptic, it's, a, it's tightening. I can do all of that without actually having to do an enema or take any medicine, you mm -hmm. know, it's yeah. just having that fight back again. And I think it has to be a lot of, it's a lot of education. Yeah. You know, all of this is marketing. You know, our children are watching TV. They're watching American shows and everybody thinks that, oh, that's better than what we have here. So I think we need to change the narrative a little bit. Yeah. And start from, start educating people a little bit. And I think not understanding, because sometimes I remember you know, after a woman has birth, uh, gives birth, they cook special meals for her in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And they would cook very high in iron um, food. And obviously, before I didn't know those produce were high in iron, I just, they would just say, oh, this is what a woman eats after having birth. But they wouldn't explain because she's lost a lot of blood. Therefore, yep. the food that she's yep. eating is good for that. They just say, yep. oh, no, it's good. Oh, dear. No, you blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And I think yeah. that's the issue where people don't know why they were doing something. Yeah. The ancestors may may know, but they're no longer there to explain they why explain it was it. done. And people yeah. are passing that information on. Yeah. They don't know why. They say just because. And so people stop doing it because they're like, well, I can't trust what you're saying because you don't even know why you're doing it. That's true. I'll tell you a story. I remember when I had when I had my daughter. Um, I had um, she was really big. She was uh, she was a ten kilo baby. She was massive. Yes. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. And I had trouble breastfeeding, you know. <laughs> so I was frustrated. My mother was frustrated. So she calls in my grandmother. And this old lady takes some shea butter, puts in a handful of salt, and rubs it over my breasts. In 30 minutes, I had so much milk in there to breastfeed. So now my science mind starts wondering. I'm like, okay, now why did this work? And I'm like, oh, of course. Salt will pull. Salt will pull water from wherever it is to you. That's what the salt does. The shea butter was to give it that barrier to let it move. So all it did, all the salt and the shea butter did was move the milk that was already in me to the front of my breasts. Do you see what I mean? Through the yeah. shea butter. I'm like, of, co of course, now it made sense. But as she was doing it, you know, she wasn't giving me any scientific explanation. She just said that, okay, this is how we do it. You have shea butter, bring me salt. <laughs> and that was it. So you're absolutely right. You know, yeah. we, we should be getting the whys and how does this work and why does it work and what is what ingredient is making it do A, B, C, D. You know, we are, we are now having to try and do that with the science that we know now, you know, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's easier to be able to do it from the ancestors, from, yeah. from the knowledgeable old ladies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so that's what I do. I try to piece it together and see the ingredients, yeah. I to look for the name and then say, okay, this is why it does that. I yeah. still believe it, but now I can explain it to someone else exactly. and makes it packageable because without the why you can't sell it to someone else. That's so it. yeah, uh, thank you so much for for sharing that and giving us some more insight or, on how you know you work with people, how you know we can get um, services from your your products from the shop, but also get you know treated and work, take care of our well being. Tell us a little bit about what we can expect for the six you know six coming months to one year. What are some of the big things you're in the works we are working on for you yeah. know Kedar Health. Oh, Kida Health. Okay. Yes, yes, Kida. It's Kida Health. Yeah. You know, um, we're trying to do a lot more um corporate training and coaching. You know, mm -hmm. we started at this end of this year. Um, but my goal is just to teach as much as possible. I, I want as much as possible to let people understand that you know what, it is so easy 
to be healthy. My goal is to give everybody optimum health. You yeah. know, so don't don't let's not get sick. You're going to eat anyway. So why don't you just eat the foods that will make sure that you know you're you're as healthy as possible. Yeah. And if you do have any ailments, why don't we do it naturally? You know, mm-hmm. so it's a lot. We want to do a lot more talks. Okay, um, we have a few of our own products um that we already have, but there are a few more that we're we're developing. You know, yeah. some of the shea butters, a little bit more of the teas. Um, there's one thing, one big thing. You know, you mentioned that you have fibroids. Okay, one of the big things that helps with fibroids is Precocet. Yeah, it's a powder. Okay, so um, we'll be coming out with a like I said tincture. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're working on. Um, it's a lot more services. I actually did want to do the V steaming, right? I just need to do get a little space um in the center to do that as well. You know, and amazing. also concentrate concentrate on women's a little bit more on the women's health as well. Mm-hmm. So everybody, um, for me. I like to tell everybody that your health is in your hands. Your health is in you. are your own best doctor. You know your body more than anybody else. Because for doctors and pharmacists, for us to be able to help you, you have to, you are the one who has to tell us what is wrong. Yeah. So there are so many instances where somebody has gone to a doctor and then on their way home, they re- remember that, oh my goodness, I forgot to tell the doctor that my back was hurting. Or I forgot to tell the doctor that I had a pain in my, in my knee. Yeah. You know? You know your body the best. Mm-hmm. So listen to your body. Listen. Sometimes the tests, the doctors coming, it doesn't, you know your body best. Okay. Mm-hmm. So eat and make sure that your mind, your mind is clear. You are you're happy. You're settled. Your heart is full of gratitude, you know, and that's optimum health for everybody. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Oh, sorry. I mean- Love that. And I cannot wait to be on the ground, come visit your health center. And Yay. What it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you would like to share as a tip to anyone thinking, you know, whether it comes to dealing with grief or, you know, things that can help them gain optimal health? One last uh, tip you want to share in any areas. Um, for me, it will be my mantra. My mantra, every, every day must bring me joy. That's my mantra, okay? So always when I'm giving tips, make sure that you are living your life in joy. Because when you're full inside, there's so much more you can give to everybody else, right? But you must always do you first. Mm -hmm. Do you first. Be your healthiest self. A lot of women ask me, it's like, no, but I can't. You know, I'm looking after children, I'm looking after husband, I'm looking after the, the home, I'm working. And I'm like, yes, but if you are not looking after yourself first, you can't do any of it. Exactly. You, you can't do any of it. So do you first. I love that. <laughs> I love that because, you know, I host a wellness retreat every year in Ghana and our the, the theme is self-love. It's the self-love yeah. retreat. And it's a week to give yourself back the love that you've... So give to everybody, but not to yourself. To, to disconnect and to um, fill up your own cup yeah. for you. Because uh, um, if you're not full, you're a frustrated mom. You're a frustrated yeah. partner. Nobody wants to be around you. So if your cup is full, you overflow and give more. You're overflowing. Them. Yeah. Make sure I'm at the next retreat. Let me know. Oh, when yeah, next for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome. It was a lovely Thank conversation. You. I will leave you, all Ray. your details in the description box below. If you want to hear awesome. more about her work and how you can get in touch with her, definitely I'll leave the description here. Reach out to her. And where can we follow you on Instagram or uh, if you can mention some of your platforms, even though I'll leave okay. it. Okay, all right. Um, the website is a live website. I like to tell people that because it's it's live you can order anything you want from the website we deliver internationally so if you go to www.kedahealth.com mm-hmm. all right everything that we do is there our handles were on facebook and instagram as um at Kida health great okay? thank you <laughs> thank you thanks for thanks watching everyone and i'll see you next week bye <laughs>